Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, we do have a, a fantastic uh, panel, um, very broad spectrum of folks across uh, content uh, distribution, creation, and um, implementation of, of these, these technologies. You look at um, the notion of a DVR really as a paradigm because it's a transcendent technology. It isn't just a box. It's a way of looking at how one manages content and manages clients and customers because this has um, been a true game changer for the way programmers look at the world and the way um, people look at content. Um, the notion of an affinity brand across every kind of, of media platform, which I think is the goal of, of Home Box Office and many others, is, is to be wherever their cu customers take their content. And that's not the old world linear, you know, sit at the couch. This is, a, this is about mobility. This is about portability. This is about on every platform um, available today and, and in the future. And that's where I think this conversation will go. What you have, of course, is a, is a great collection of folks um, across um, the spectrum. I'm going to have to type uh, Javier's information here on this slide as we get along because it looks like they missed it. But in any event, what we do have on this panel, let me introduce from, from my, well, you're right, to all the way down the panel. I'll start with Ron Samuel from, from Utilsat. Um, Utilsat is one of the prime satellite operators across Europe. Um, a significant player in the distribution of video across, I can't even begin to count how many countries, probably about 40, give or take. Um, next to Steve is, um, I mean, uh, next to Ron is Steve Simons from, um, from um, RaceAt Broadcasting, which is a, a very interesting business model. This is about the mobility play. So um, for many folks, the best sound system they have is actually not in the house, it's in the car. Um, there's a lot of Bose 5.1 in the car, and if you think about how, how people look at programming these days, when you talk mobility, the, the, the proposition from RaceAt is to put essentially a DVR and a, and a, and a, and a satellite buffer um, in, in mobile vehicles, which is an extension of how people will look at content. I think you're going to find this very interesting as well. Next to Steve is Javier Berlendo from, um, from Verizon Wireless. Verizon, uh, clearly one of the leaders in high-speed broadband and, um, and high-speed and high-quality video applications, a significant player in the market. Uh, two, three years ago, I don't know that they passed a million homes with content. I think now they are a very significant player in this business um, and uh, add a lot of value to how people look at content. Next to Javier is Bob Zitter. Um, uh, who's Chief Technology Officer and um, of Home Box Office. Bob's um, been in the, in the satellite and cable world since its infancy. Um, well, pre-cradle even in that matter. Oh. Oh. But not quite to the grave yet, Bob. We're not counting you out. Quit while you're ahead. Uh, I was going to go with Eminence Greece, but, there, but um, we'll, we'll leave that be. Um, but, but Bob has seen all, uh, all the evolutions of how people move from the linear world to the nonlinear, and um, he's been a chief architect of a lot of the success for, for, for how people look at the content business, and I'm very interested to hear what Bob has to say. And to Bob's right is Dan Danes, who is um, general manager of VIP TV, which is the IP platform business operated by EchoStar which again is yet another implementation how, of how people are morphing the content business. We're not talking analog linear, we're not talking MPEG-2, we're talking IP television delivered over satellite to any form of last mile distribution partner. And so this is all um, where this conversion and this collision in, in, in the media marketplace is taking place. So I'm going to offer everyone a, a few minutes to, to provide a little more detail on their perspective on, uh, on the, on the the DVR as an appliance or as a paradigm and, and how they're approaching the content and, and media business. So let me, let me start first with, with Dan to give us a, a perspective from um, the satellite side. Dan? Well, first of all, I, I will have to say that within EchoStar, I'm viewed as the in-house cannibal, of course. Uh, before we split DISH and EchoStar up a little over a year ago, you know, DISH was always thought of as an ARPU company, a direct-to-home, and, you know, just chunking down that line. EchoStar and DISH became two separate companies. We're still friends, no more than we ever were, and uh, we have technology on one side and the ARPU business on another. My business is IPTV, essentially headed in the sky for telcos, which is counter to what DISH is all about in some cases. But looking at the larger picture, 
We have to remember, if I have a stump speech, it's about the content. It's not about the technology, and I believe that strongly, and all of us here really are technology people. There's a few content people out there, but we, we get focused on the content. I believe that one of the biggest shifts in the industry, of course, is um, the DBR and the functionality, whether it's a box or whether it's a software, that taking the content where you are is a human factor. The artificial nature of linear television over the last 75 years of controlling when people eat dinner, when they go to the bathroom, when they sit, when they laugh and cry is not natural to humans. And so as we go through this chaos period, we are have an opportunity again to kind of reorder the universe along the lines that we're all comfortable with, and that is to take our stories with us. And we need to provide that technology in the most cost-effective and, and also technically effective manner. The satellite business is not going to go away. There's places that the best way to get the bulk of the content to people is going to be in the satellite. Whether you have a little antenna on top of your car, or whether it's your house, or on a train, or it's your mobile device, satellites will play a role. Wireline, whether it's gig on a stick for Wi-Fi, or fiber, or traditional cable, and the telcos with their twisted pairs going out through the farmlands. I mean, remember, telcos started out with barbed wire, and some of them haven't come that much farther from that. And so there's a lot of technologies, but it's really about the content. Did I offend anybody already? I hope so. Okay. So I'm, I'm not a true believer in the satellite business. hate to say that. I'm, I believe in using the best technology solution to get the content to the use point and to bring it back as necessary. And so my preaching today and on is that this is an opportunity. This time of chaos is an opportunity to reorder content data networks and television operators and, and, and broadband operators and to come together and to make something new out of the universe a little bit. And so we can talk more about that as you ask the questions. But it's a pleasure to be here and to, to talk about this. Thank you, Dan. I'll, I'll then ask Javier to, um, uh, I think there's a little more than barbed wire defending his moat, but um, I'm sure I'll have something to say about that. Sure. You have the slides available? Yeah, let me. Uh, I'm going to need some help with that, guys. Anyway, while we're waiting for the slides, I'm Javier Borland, I work for the Fios TV and Corporate Marketing. I'm here just to start the debate on the DVR business and give you an overview on what is the Fios network first and why we are saying that the Fios home network is really optimized to deliver DVR any content, any time in the room, in, the, in any room, anywhere, and also give an overview of what is our current DVR offer and a couple of enhancements we have in our pipes for the next two or three months. So with that said, I'd like to introduce you to the Fios Home for those who are not familiar with it, right? We deliver fiber directly to the home. On the fiber, we have all, a, all our services. And the first thing the fiber will see is the optical network terminal, which is our interface between the fiber and the home network. Talking about the home network and why I'm saying it's optimized for the delivery of any content anywhere in the home, right? We selected coax as the backbone for all our services for video and data. We have what we call coaxial interfaces using Mocha technology integrated in our setups, in our broadband home router, and in our optical network terminal. This way, all our video and data services are routed through the home via the broadband home router and provides a very easy way to provision services to facilitate installation. And our main goal, to deliver signal from the hub DVR from anywhere in the home. That's basically why the FIO, FIO selected COAS to, to deliver services within the home. Now we talk about our DVR offer, right? What's the current status of the DVR? Our decision was first to provide a very strong support within the home for the DVR services. That's why we work first the network, enabling our setups and our ONT and our routers to deliver all the VR services and signals within the home. After that, we start in deploying our standard DVR service, which I would call traditional DVR. You know, all those, uh, all those features, including schedule recording, uh, parental controls, browsing, canceling stuff, fast forward, etc. In addition to that, right, we add, a, a, I would say, a, a, a very, very strong flexibility to this offer by 
um, three different components. Those components are first the multi-room DVR. As soon as we launched the DVR offer, immediately after that we started working on a multi-room environment. That way, every setup in the home, standard definition or high definition now, can work as a virtual DVR and convert itself in a DVR without the need for a hard drive. So this has a lot of flexibility to the service, allowing our users to start watching one content in one room, stop, continue watching in another room, and have the same feature we have in your main DVR available in any room in the home. The second component we have is what we call the media manager. The media manager is an application that takes advantage also of the home network and allows users to watch their pictures that are stored on their PCs, all their personal contents and their personal music in their home entertainment or in their TVs using the interactive media guide. So rather than going to your computer, you can use your remote control in your TV and watch your pictures, listen to your music in your entertainment center with our media manager um, capabilities. Finally, we developed the remote DVR. With the remote DVR feature, via website, you can actually control your DVR, doing your scheduling, setting up your parental controls, and in certain wireless Verizon phones, you also have some control because you can download the application and control your features remotely. Finally, as the next step on the DVR, on the, on the next slide, you will be able not only to access your personal content at this point, pictures and music with your DVR, but also your personal videos. Our application will allow users to basically browse their computer files, video files this time, and basically see their videos in the TV using the interactive media guide. Not only that, but we will also enable uh, users to stream videos for certain um, websites that we have agreements with, like Dailymotion, Blip TV, Vio. Uh, from those websites and using the IMG, our users will, users will be able to stream content directly to their TVs, and not only that, but also browse the content. They will see an icon with a company we have agreement with, and that icon will give you basically access to all the contents, and you know, a, a very powerful video search en engine will allow them to search by keyword, by type of content, by categories, top contents rated, etc. That's basically my overview of the Verizon Network and Fios DVR services. And with that, I'll just pass in the mic microphone to the next one. Uh, thank you, Javier. Next, uh, I'm going to hear a, a bit of a European perspective from Ron. Uh, was that, uh, let me just find your slide here. How's that labeled? Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. Um, okay. As um, Mike uh, introduced earlier, Utilsat's one of the top. Uh, How do you? Here you go, Ryan. Uh, okay. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> Mike has already introduced Utilsat. Uh, we're one of the top uh, satellite operators, um, and uh, we uh, multi-regional. We cover the Americas, continental Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia. Um, roughly uh, 70 plus percent of our business is for providing uh, 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 multimedia, particularly TV services. <coughs> the, we have 26 satellites in 26 satellites in orbit today, and uh, typically they have very very broad coverage, and we provide a lot of linear uh, channels. Now, now Bob Zitter, I, I know he thinks that linear channels are going to be relegated to the past, but we, we've actually got 3,200 TV channels broadcasting. That's the lifetime of your satellites. Ah, okay, I'll come right to that. And um, 1,100 of those are on one focused um, satellite position called Hotbird at 13 degrees, which illuminates continental Europe and the Middle East. And um, HDTV is a driver that, that we have 75 HD TV channels at the moment. Um, so the question is, what's going to happen in the future? And I thought I'd give you a glimpse of a satellite that we're launching next year uh, called KASAT. It's going to be over Europe and it has some coverage of the Middle East and Africa. It, it has multiple um, beams, it's KA band. It has a cell phone reuse pattern, fourfold reuse, so it provides. Um, huge amount of capacity for consumers, for broadband for consumers. And this will be serving the underserved parts of Europe. 
rural areas, uh, areas where people aren't satisfied with the service, and even areas for competition because the pricing should be similar to other mainstream DSL services for DSL plus quality. Now, um, this opens the door for um, a whole no load of new developments because you could have bundled services coming down to uh, DTH uh, TV service providers. The model in Europe is a little bit different. The satellites, uh, high power TV satellites carry a mixture of uh, DTH services for dedicated suppliers such as Sky Italia for example. And on, on top of that it, 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 it carries um, TV distribution for cable networks for their head ends. For, for, because in every country across Europe you may have a mixture of cable platforms, uh, DTH platforms. So we serve everything um, ubiquitously across our satellite uh, fleet. And I help the satellites carry a mixture of DTH and cable. So uh, how does DVR affect that? Well, it, it, I'm not sure if that's why we've been expanding so much, but we've expanded by, I think, a thousand TV channels over the last year or two, enormous expansion, particularly for emerging countries. But looking ahead to KASAT with uh, its consumer broadband pipes, this could enable um, DTH providers, for example, to bundle uh, IP in with their, it's co-located with Hotbirds, by the way, so they could have HD on the same dish coming down, plus uh, broadband, and they could offer video on demand over the broadband, or, or, or you know, IPTV, voice over IP. So it does open the door to a lot of things, but how does this affect the design of DVRs for this evolution in satellite technology that's happening not years away, next year? This will be in service next year. Um, so I, I think I'd better stop there, just, just to give a flavor for the, um, the way technology is moving for satellite operators. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Ron. I think uh, my next uh, speaker will tell you that it's not that next year. It's last year, and it's on the move already. And that's uh, Steve Simons. Why don't you give us a, a brief on uh, Reset? Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, thanks to WTA. Um, and this is a, a, a relatively new offer in the marketplace. We, we, uh, as soon as the slide comes up, you'll be able to look at it. This is um, uh, AT&T CruiseCast, and um, we call it the living room on wheels. Uh, and basically, it is uh, direct to home, except it's a moving home. Uh, the, there's a small antenna on the roof of the vehicle, as you can see there. It's a tracking antenna. Um, this is the, the launch model, which involves a combination of solid state and mechanical parts, mechanical elevation, uh, uh, received direct from the satellite, uh, and then in, into a set-top box, mobile set-top box, and then onward to your rear seat entertainment screens. Um, and um, it's, uh, there's actually quite a number of vehicles out there in the market today, uh, approximately 15 to 20 million that already have rear seat entertainment systems and about a million more being introduced every year. Uh, up to this point, the only way that they've been able to make use of those systems has been pre-recorded DVDs. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing, um, next slide, Mike. Uh, what we're going to be doing is like, I know, I'm going to let them dwell on this one oh, for okay. like a second. This is not uh, a subliminal presentation. Got Steve. it. Uh, we're going to be starting with the aftermarket and at the same time working with the auto manufacturers to integrate the technology into the vehicle at the factory. Uh, the service will be available uh, starting next month. We're already in soft launch now. These are the channels, uh, many of the channels that we're trialing with right now. And um, uh, why we dub it the living room on wheels is because for the most part these are the same linear channels that you can watch uh, at home, whether it's uh, delivered to you via cable or via satellite. Uh, we'll be launching with 22 video channels and 20 satellite radio channels, and um, uh, the satellite radio channels will be provided by uh, through Music Choice. Uh, it's a um, uh, we have a fairly robust technology roadmap, uh, both for downsizing the antenna. Uh, this is a this this is a little description of how the um, uh, in the system works. Uh, we're presently on an Intelsat satellite. Uh, it's as I said received by the rooftop antenna, distributed down to the uh, mobile set-top box, and then onwards to the 
um, rear seat entertainment screens. And um, our, our roadmap, we start with broadcast uh, networks, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, a bro broadcast one-way system mo uh, with satellite uh, delivered cable networks. Um, next generation will include a, a, a 3G chipset for connectivity um, and uh, local points of interest, points of information. Um, uh, we're already, obviously already talking with the um, uh, ATSC, mobile ATSC folks about incorporating a tuner so that people can get their uh, local broadcast channels um, as integrated into our overall system. And um, it's... Uh, uh, I think there's one more slide, or is that? Yeah, but uh, this one, might, I don't know if you got it on the next slide, but you might want to talk about you know the, the buffering model you have to use in this, in this mobile type application. That's is a that good you? idea, since it's such an important feature. This, the, these rooftop antennas have been around for a while. They've been big, expensive, noisy. Uh, by big, I mean they swallow the roof of a Hummer. So not only um, have we downsized it and made it uh, whisper quiet and much less expensive, um, We've also developed a proprietary uh, line of sight blockage technology. So while you're driving and you're, uh, you've got line of sight, you're building a video buffer. So if you go under a tunnel, um, into a tunnel, under an overpass, you go by a tree line that would obscure your direct line of sight to the satellite, uh, you're continuously watching uninterrupted video or, or listening to audio. It's a roughly a three minute buffer uh, and we've determined through a variety of testing that that overcomes uh, pretty much all of the significant line of sight obstacles, you know, excepting Midtown Manhattan. I mean, uh, gonna have a hard time Bob driving in from his home to you know in Midtown to be able to see the signal all the way. But uh, aside from that, in suburban environments, um, it's wonderful. Um, in in a number of inner city environments, uh, inner city environments, it's also good but it's a challenge so we're looking and working with our partner AT&T to uh, come up with terrestrial augmentation but out of the gate um, it's going to be with the video buffer it's going to be uh, really a solid service um, and um, we're going to be launching it next month. Uh, on our roadmap also it's worth noting that we are uh, very much pursuing a, um, a, a portable DVR. We're not quite sure how that's going to play out we call it side loading. Take it from your home DVR to your vehicular DVR. Don't bother spending money on DVDs. You've already got it. Um, of course, that'll have to be done in cooperation with the content owners and, and whatever sort of uh, commercial licensing restrictions they're going to impose on moving that content from the home and into the vehicle. And um, okay, well, we'll 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 strike it there. And okay. you know, and all that leads us back to. Um, home box office and uh, content providers everywhere um, as uh, people to look at these as opportunities and, and challenges to the, their, their existing business models. How do they adapt or enable content to ride across all these platforms? What, what goes into the thought process of a home box when you look at all these technologies and, and opportunities in the marketplace, Bob? First of all, I, I need to go back to the beginning. Uh, that while I might have had a long career so far, I, I really do believe that some of the, the integration between technology and business opportunities the next five years are going to be far more interesting than anything that I've experienced so far in my career. Uh, and linear television is not going away. Right. You are but, certainly living in interesting times, okay. Bob. As, as However, said. my children and my grandchildren don't know what linear television is because they don't use it. Uh, and, you know, they find no reason to use it. Uh, and uh, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, in terms of HBO, I, I think everyone uh, you know, should understand that we're different than many, probably most program networks, whether it's broadcast or the uh, uh, cable satellite networks, in that we don't carry advertising. So our revenue is totally based upon offering our subscribers something of value uh, that they'll pay for. And over the years, about 30% of the United States said that they were interested in paying for the things that we offer. Uh, and so whatever we do needs to uh, complement and you know, uh, enhance that, because there are plenty of other people who are offering content on a transactional basis, you know, pay-per-view or whatever, uh, DVD, or ad-supported. Uh, while we started distributing HBO over cable, and it was actually the engine that used, was used by the cable industry to finance their 
construction. Uh, we, uh, I didn't bring any slides, by the way. So I don't know what they're doing over there. Ignore uh, the man behind the curtain. Bob. Yeah, ignore the man behind the curtain. Uh, uh, when the satellite business started, actually before the DBS business started, uh, HBO was the first company in the United States, and I believe in the world, to begin selling satellite programming directly to consumers. We did it in large C-band dishes. Uh, it's the reason we scrambled our satellite networks in 1986. Uh, and uh, we did it so that uh, uh, there could be a multitude of ways of consumers to subscribe to HBO. And, and so we've been uh, distributing our programming through the U.S. and international DBS operators now for up to 15 years, as well as cable. Uh, and as well as the telco networks as they've been building. Uh, actually, we've had about 200 telephone affiliates for over 10 years. They were small affiliates in using DSL technology uh, in rural areas. Our focus is that we want to provide our programming services to consumers regardless of what technology uh, they opt for, cable, satellite, telephone. Uh, we think, from our perspective, the competition is, is great. Uh, and uh, the differences and the nuances in some of the technologies uh, uh, wind up being good for consumers because uh, it uh, advances things. For years, I was pushing uh, our distributors to not compromise on quality as we move to digital television. And I have to tell you, I sat back and enjoyed uh, the marketing campaigns between uh, Verizon, the DBS people, and the telecom and the cable people, about who had the best quality and high definition. Uh, you know, it's it's competitive world. Uh, you know, now they're asking me for higher quality product, and you know, so I, I love that. Uh, we're also on the verge. You've probably been hearing about taking HBO to broadband and using the internet. Uh, so uh, what, what, what it really is about is we want consumers to be able to, uh, uh, if they're an HBO subscriber through any of our distributors, cable, satellite, or telco, we want them to be able to watch HBO and our programming on any device that they like to use anywhere they go. In the United States, we have different businesses in Europe, Asia, Latin America. Uh, and so with that, we're rolling out a product called HBO Go, which will mean that if you are an HBO subscriber from uh, you know, any of our distributors and have a broadband connection, you'll be able to uh, see our HBO offering, which is largely on demand, uh, uh, it was, it was, uh, almost entirely on demand, uh, not just on your TVs, but on your computers and on your portable devices and on your cell phones. Uh, and. Uh, you know, but you have to be a subscriber. It's the value of the HBO subscription. We started something called HBO On Demand uh, in 2001. We actually developed the technology and tested it in Orlando, Florida in 1994 where we developed some of the patents on it. It was something called the full service network for those of you who are uh, as old as Mike, he would remember that. Uh, and the... Uh, my, my, arteries, my arteries did harden waiting for that to become a successful product, by the way, Bob. Well. The product was successful as soon as we rolled it out. The problem was in 1994, the set-top box to support it cost $4,000. So by 2001, it was a $150 device. Uh, the servers in the head end were $3 million. By 2001, it was deployable uh, and affordable. Uh, HBO On Demand uh, was rolled out slightly before the DVR. Uh, and uh, and now more than half of our subscribers in the United States have HBO on demand. Uh, and with the exception of one of our distributors, it's offered to the subscribers for free uh, if you're an HBO subscriber and you obviously need digital service. Uh, it's wound up being a tremendous win for us and our distributors because uh, HBO on demand has had more viewership of any on demand programming than uh, not just anything else, but everything else combined in the United States. Uh, it's the way people want to watch television. As the DVRs came out, that was fine with us. If, uh, you know, the advantage between a DVR and, uh, and, and HBO On Demand, which is a server-based technology, uh, where you don't need any equipment in the home, 
uh, is with HBO On Demand, you don't have to plan in advance, uh, you know, to have your DVR capture the programming. Uh, and with DVRs, uh, you know, you do, uh, and uh, you know all about that. From our perspective, the, the real story is that today, less than 50% of our viewers watch a programming at the day and time that we premiere it on one of our linear channels. More than 50% watch it on either one of our multiplex feeds. We have 26 versions of HBO and Cinemax. Uh, that's a, essentially a near video on demand to place things at different times during the week. Uh, or via HBO on demand or on DVR. We don't care when they watch it or through which source. Uh, and unlike advertiser supported networks, we don't really care uh, you know, how many people watch it. We just want, if you're an HBO subscriber, we want to know that you're using our service enough so that next month you'll send a check in to say, I want to continue my HBO service. That's what it's about. So uh, why don't I leave it at that for now? Yeah, I actually have a question I want to follow on that because beyond being zealous, about the quality of your feed, of course, now you've got to adapt it to all these platforms. And it's one thing to say, I, I, you know, I want it high def quality, but then again, you've got to run it on cell phones and PDAs and all kinds of devices at less than 400 kilobits. And you know, five years ago, that would have been clutch cargo video in a lot of applications. It would have been jerky and, and not terribly usable. And today, of course, there's been advances virtually every week in that. I, I think uh, you're right. One of the things for those of us who create and distribute television, that is, it's an unfortunate circumstance of how the industry has gone, is we're going backwards. For many years, if you created programming, you distributed in either PAL or NTSC worldwide. That was it. Uh, today, to give you an example, we have HBO On Demand in the UK. Uh, it's distributed through two IPTV operators and one cable operator. I have to create three different versions, same program, same schedule, they each have different technologies, want different metadata, different uh, resolution, different screen shape. Uh, the, uh, uh, I won't point any fingers here, but there is one major telephone company that's in the video distribution business, and it's not the phone company sitting next to me, that is using MPEG-4 technology, but slightly differently than everyone else's. Uh, when DirecTV first started DBS, they used MPEG-2, kind of. It was MPEG-1.8. Uh, 1. 1. Yeah. 1. Uh, so the problem without standardization, it doesn't really make any difference who pays for any of this, but we've now had to, or other third parties, have had to develop infrastructures to make a million different versions of stuff. That winds up costing someone money and time in the whole food chain. Uh, unfortunately, it's been driven by the people who make devices, portable devices, your company, I think is involved in Arcos, uh, Echo, sorry. Yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in sorry. In case you weren't sure, Dan. Yeah. Uh, no, so, you know, uh, people come up with cell phones. Uh, we, we have a deal with Vodafone for HBO on mobile. Uh, there have to be, I think, 26 different versions of the same HBO programming going on the Vodafone handset. So. Uh, it's a pain. I think the one thing that's going to happen with HBO uh, on broadband that many of our distributors are working towards is something called uh, dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic data rates, where uh, HBO broadband will start at about, uh, we'll have a standard definition version and a high definition version at different data rates. Uh, but some distributors will uh, offer it dynamically based upon the computer capability and the link capability of, of the consumer. And that changes, as you know, if you're you know, connected to uh, a cable modem uh, and the data rate uh, increases because the load you know, lightened, uh, it'll automatically move you up to a higher data rate and improve the quality and it'll move it down, uh, you know, depending upon what's going on in your link. Or whether or not you're on a 3G network or not. 
if you just fall off the, the yeah. main contours of a telco network. It, that leads me to my next question, which is, how a, again, how are the devices or the appliances shaping the way you look at DVRs? A lot of it comes down, as, as Bob started the, to reference, to the computing power of that terminal at the end. But of course, there are any number of ways to spoof it by a central serve cast model and all kinds of other ways to create the virtual DVR, and that's really what, what everyone's shaping it. And I'm interested to hear how all the panelists look at that differently. You know, it's almost unfair to ask a device company what uh, you know. What do you do without devices? So let's let's look into the future. The the set top box has been around a lot longer than we all thought it would be um, ten years ago. If you remember, we thought the set top box could be replaced and integrated into the into the glass or any other device, but we found out there were a lot of other dependencies as new devices and new technologies would roll along, we found we had to keep these pieces. And so it really does pose a problem for the industry and the content providers to keep up with all these devices. And personally, I believe in, in a, a standards-based marketplace so that you create a level playing field, and if you have to vary from that, it should be the responsibility of the operator, whoever it is, to then have to re-encode or re retransmit the product at a quality that's acceptable to the content provider. Given that, there's realities, the cold, harsh realities of market prices and the technology that you want to get out to the business. So you're hinting at or talking about Slingbox. We have Slingbox out there that uh, EchoStar acquired a year and a half ago, and it provides and fills the gap for people who want to do exactly what most people want to do take their entertainment choices with them but because of the unmanaged network that they you have to play over the internet is very difficult to keep the quality high so you're getting a shadow of the quality that you really want i i believe that those things will continue to progress and we'll eventually be able to get to a level of quality in any device but the device manufacturers even us we should not be driving the market. It's the it's the content and the consumers that people are asking, you know, that they want. It's not you know, people don't want Equistar or Dish. They want the content. And Dish, if we have the best deal, they're gonna take it from us. And it's always been that way. The cycle is generally in, in technology, and this has been back since the days of um, the telegraph, ten to fifteen years to move from early introduction, early adopters, and then go to a point of ubiquity where it levels out and everybody's buying it. Every technology has followed that same course because you've got to get economies of scale on manufacturing and everything else. So how do we do it? I think people have to keep the pressure on. The HBOs of the world have to keep the pressure on the operators to use the devices that will make it work in, this, in the economy and get it to the mass audience. There will always be the geeks that are the gadget freaks, you know, that will buy anything, no matter what it is, and show off because we all know what that is. You know, it's a substitution for other things. And so we have to realize that there's no money in it until you get to the end of the hockey stick and you're up onto the plateau. That's where the money is, and you can build a business plan around that. So. The people who control the content have the opportunity to say, no, there's a minimum standard for what we're going to do and push that. And I agree with that. Uh, well, we love our DVRs. We love our sling boxes. But people love the content, not the devices. I think you just equated early adopters to cigar smokers or there's some other reference in there. And it's probably way over my head. So I'll just turn over to Javier here to talk about how he looks at it. Yeah, I tend to agree with Dan's comments, and I will add another dimension to his comments. Right? We talk about devices, we talk about content, but it's really important too what you know the user, how the user can basically access the content. I'm talking about the management, right? The system must provide the capabilities for using to enjoy the content across platforms and devices whenever they want, wherever they are, and that's very important. And that relies basically in a very advanced you know network and system. And some concessions we need for the content owners are sometimes on, on the encryption side, right? That basically provides a more flexibility on the on the management. But uh, again, I tend to agree with the contents, but don't forget that the access to the content must be very easy from anywhere, everywhere. 
we don't really, users don't really want to depend on devices to access the content. They already had the devices. You already buy your cell phones, your DVRs, or your TVs, right? You want to see the content in those devices and not being required to change the device every time you want to enjoy something. That's why it's very important to make sure that the network support those devices and I prepare, right, to basically provide a good way to evolve with the industry to not only the new devices but also the install base. Okay, well, uh, we will open the floor to questions, so if anybody's got one, raise your hand, otherwise I'll just keep on flinging them out here. But if you do, just, uh, if you go stand in the center and, and Randy will find the mic for you. But um, next question I've got, I think Bob started to hit on it in terms of the generational shift we've seen in, in the audiences and however we use this content. We've got, we've, we're, we're leaving the world of what I would call the lean back, which is sitting on the couch and let people deliver programming to you, and we're moving towards the lean forward. Uh, younger people are all about the now. They, whatever they wanted to know, they're not waiting until after the commercial break to get it. They're either online or they're Twittering it or they're, they're finding the, whatever they want to know. Their instant information or entertainment is right in front of them and it creates a challenge for um, traditional um, content channels and broadcasters and all of us who, who play up and down the food chain. So I'm interested to hear, um, again, how you're adapting to that generational shift. Bob? Yeah, I think uh, something I've been talking about within my company, every, every year there's uh, several new companies that offer a new box that helps bridge uh, the Internet into the TV. And, and I've been saying, forget about all of those new boxes. The one that I've been keeping my eye on is now all the major manufacturers of television sets are selling TVs that not only have an input for a cable or satellite, but for the Internet. And these TV screens are a lot larger than they've been before. And so they're going to feed the desires of multitaskers, who are the generational people that you know are uh, interested in integrating their entertainment with information, with other things that they're doing. Uh, you know, uh, and and the folks at FiOS and other people have been starting to uh, take advantage of some of the capabilities, even in the traditional television distribution, of having user interfaces and interactivity that's um, allowing people to do more than just passively watch a television program. Uh, in our case, uh, some of our distributors uh, are have been moving towards levels of interactivity. But I think where you're really going to see it is uh, as, as we roll out our HBO Go broadband product uh, that you'll be able to uh, offer so much more than just watching the video asset. Uh, whether it's socialization or whether it's you know, more information or whether it's doing uh, multiple things at the same time, uh, that television device, if you say it is now as an average 42-inch screen, uh, can do many things, and how it does those things programmers care about. Uh, you know, we don't like it, for example, if Verizon were going to overlay advertising, uh, you know, on an HBO program because we don't carry or can't carry advertising. But, uh, but it does open up just a, a whole new world of things that you can do. And uh, in the past, everyone's been doing it in a two-screen environment. Uh, HBO, some of our competitors, when we run boxing, uh, on the network, we'll have things on our website that are complementary in terms of information and things like that. Uh, on the uh, Bill Maher show, which we run, you know, it, it continues for another 15 minutes or so online in a much more interactive format. Well, that's really going to be able to come to one unified experience. Want to weigh in, Ron? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Just to. Uh, so I agree with everything Bob said and we're trying to facilitate the future. Right now, today, uh, we provide a lot of professional uh, broadband IP services, including to aircraft, ships, and uh, uh, also to groups of consumers on uh, existing KA payloads and KU for countries such as Switzerland for consumer uh, two-way broadband. With the new satellite, that'll be expanded enormously for consumer broadband, but also at the set-top box side. Um, we are in partnership with Viasat that have produced uh, are producing Surfbeam 2 to enable very, very high throughputs, which will open up um, to the consumer um, high quality throughput for a whole range of new applications. Uh, there will be no more problems with, say, using Skype and various things that tend to be filtered out. It will be wide open, high quality. So we're moving down that same route and TVs having the internet uh, port 
will be able to benefit from receiving the information two ways, from the, uh, directly from the satellite linear plus the broadband port from the same orbital slot, either via the same antenna or a separate antenna. Thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, have folks comment on some of the um, cultural or, or ethnic variations on themes you see here. I mean, we've got the whole different business models that apply in, in Asia, um, where they're, again, very early adopters of, of, um, of, of networking phones and, and, and moving video, uh, some of it due to cultural, some of it due to the long commuting times in Japan and Korea and the like. Um, uh, and. The, the ethnic diaspora, which has been a huge driver of programming around the world. Um, it seems to me that in the last three or four years, we've had more channels launched out of their home markets than in their home markets uh, in terms of where the growth has been and how is that changing. Um, I mean, when we started with, with multiplexing video, we got in the opportunity to create niche casting, right? We could create little affinity versions of, of Homebox or Cinemax and other kinds of things. But now you throw the ethnicity mix and the IP transport is changing the way you can address smaller and smaller audiences that were not economically viable to programmers or, or to channel partners. Um, and how is that changing the way you look at the world? I, I think for HBO, I mean, we have... 40 million subscribers in the United States, 30 million subscribers outside the United States who, again, pay us money every month for the services. Uh, the development outside the United States of uh, all the things we're talking about, whether it's on demand or IPTV, uh, uh, high definition, uh, the like, uh, the one thing that I, I guess I would describe is it's obviously uh, in, in many respects happening later. The one exception is uh, fiber-rich markets like Korea uh, and Japan uh, or Europe, which uh, built out 3G uh, you know, before the United States did. Uh, but what we found is that things are spotty. So we have a business in Asia, covers you know, and does business in maybe 20 countries. But on-demand television and high-definition television are really limited to you know, a, a small number of countries. Uh, uh, and the rest of the market is, you know, is much more rudimentary. Uh, Latin America, you know, while we're, we're changing our satellite technology more to MPEG-4 uh, and uh, you know, being able to deliver more feeds, on-demand, high-definition, again, limited to just a few countries. Uh, so uh, I, I think that you know that's probably the norm. Uh, you know, in Europe, uh, you know, I, I defer to Ron, but you know, our Europe business, we're uh, largely in East and Central Europe, uh, that has uh, you know come a little bit slower. But I'll tell you, in Romania, one of the countries we serve, we have five competing DBS operators. I mean, you know, there are questions of how to survive in the United States. So uh, I, I think the other thing is in mobile, and, and I'm a very big believer that the future is in portability of video and services for that. But I will tell you, we started our mobile business in a number of countries, and we shut it down in South Korea this last year just because uh, it wasn't you know, doing much business. Uh, I'm going to go to Ron first, Dan. Why don't you give us a European perspective? I mean, you've got both home market and you've got the diaspora across Europe and, 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 and how that's changing your, your content model. I look at the two-way satellite, and to me that screams all about um, um, ethnic channels and, 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 a, and a chance to adapt mobility and other kinds of things to that marketplace. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right, uh, Mike. Uh, for linear channels, there's many packages focusing on particular ethnic groups in continental Europe. Um, uh, the, the, uh, Eastern Europe has had, the emerging markets has had, a, a had an explosion of business over the last couple of years and, and one example as Bob said Romania has five DTH platforms, it, there's a huge uh, growth and a lot of growth in th theme, thematic channels um, and uh, I think IPTV, uh, a voice, on, uh, video on demand will help tend to reinforce that trend going deeper and deeper into specialized groups. So it should open a whole new area of business um, on top of the, the multi multinational type business we have at the moment. Um, there's tremendous interest, uh, particularly continental Europe, have all, uh, uh, country by country have their special interests. 
um, and often people live outside those countries also want to get access to that special, special uh, uh, national channels. Um, so it's a very, very important consideration. It's growing and, and uh, 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 broadband uh, uh, TV will help to continue that trend to drill deeper and generate new business. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, we, we have the interesting um, position of we broadcast a lot of international programming on our, you know, CONUS service, which is consuming a lot of space for a relatively small number of subscribers. But they want and deserve that programming. So this move towards broadband opens up opportunities to say, have part of the service this way, and, and this minority of the service over here. How many Bulgarians do you think there are in Las Vegas? 5,000 to 6,000 Bulgarians live in Las Vegas, according to my cab driver yesterday. And I had three Bulgarian cab drivers this week. Okay, it wasn't the same guy. Chicago has the largest Bulgarian population, and one of my close friends at, at DISH is a native Bulgarian, now a naturalized American. The, the thing is, Providing ethnic language programming is not anti-assimilative, but it is culturally building. And because I, I, again, believe that it's content that counts, if we provide an infrastructure, then the market will dictate and draw quality programming and the cultural ethos that comes along with that because people have a reason that they want things in their own language, how they want to connect and, and bring things to, together. Not everybody wants to see Seinfeld in 162 languages. That's not enough. People want to bring it. If there's an opportunity, then the production values from some of these smaller language uh, population bases are going to improve because they'll be able to improve their customer base and the higher the production value and the quality of the content, the more meaningful it is as a cultural exchange. And that's why I think it's important. And we have the opportunity, we're doing that. So our customers can take our set-top box that ties to the internet, and in the future, if we want to, I'm not announcing anything, we could stop putting uh, you know, international content on the um, bird and put much more of it bringing it in through the side, and how would the customer know the difference? There, they would, we would fill those buffers and they would have high quality. And so instead of maybe one or two French, well, who would want to watch French language? Anyway, I'm, I'm just kidding. The, but instead of one or two programs from a particular language because of data space, we could bring all of the content that's available coming from a particular language base and improve that and bring that much higher. That's not device managed. That's that's infrastructure management. Can I just add something? And I, I think what Dan just talked about is the greatest example of the whole competitive world here. Uh, I, I think it was satellite companies that were the first ones to bring these international channels, certainly to the United States. Then uh, cable, and I assume uh, Fios too, started doing it when they had to switch digital platforms. So they were able to offer uh, a greater volume right. without using any bandwidth. Uh, and, and the same thing as with On Demand, uh, where they had the capabilities, but now satellite's saying, oh, wait a second, instead of connecting a phone line to the set-top box, let's connect the internet to the set-top box so that they then you know, can play in this whole competitive world at a different level. So I, I, I think that's all good. Well, and then again, you've got the, the new emerging markets for, for content distribution, the aeronautical and the mobile, which all play the same way. I mean, um, serving cruise ships with, 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 um, with content and, and airlines. Um, the sun never sets on HBO content anywhere. I mean, it, either it's a curse or a peril or an opportunity. Certainly, um, if it's what you want, it's there for you, and the channels are there. Um, of course, um, and that gets back to the audience aggregation model because it's all changing. And in the day, if it wasn't a million subscribers, it wasn't an interesting target audience for folks. It was too expensive to reach them. Um, then DBS came along, and I think their milestone, their benchmark was 100,000 subs. Looks like an interesting market. We'll make room for them on the platform. Um, then uh, on commercial satellite, you know, 25,000 subs looked interesting enough to maybe have a break-even or an operational model. And I think Telco has been late to the party, but now they see it because you look at the diaspora folks, 
and in Detroit, a very large Arab language market. Um, you look around the country, there's always been pockets of ethnicity, but they're changing with the, with the, with the, with the way the, the uh, diaspora is taking place around the world with everyone and all kinds of very interesting demographics. In the old days, of course, uh, Bob, I'm sure you remember back in the, in the 60s, you were there, I was uh, nearly there. Um, the best way to measure an audience was the flusho meter, right, during, a, during a, a football game, was to look at the plumbing meters in New York um, to know who was watching. Um, then, of course, we've, as we ta uh, target all these audiences, they're different. Now, HBO, in one sense, doesn't really care. So you may just measure the cash register from your subscribers and say, the more platforms I put out there, and as long as the checks come in, I must be doing something right. Well, it's not so much the cash register that we have. HBO is a very pro profitable business, uh, certainly compared to other television networks. What it's about is... Uh, we have a lot of different choices of original programming and movies. Not everyone watches them all. We don't target them for everyone. But if you're getting what you're interested in and it's relative to the value that you're paying, you're going to want to continue that. And, and that's what's important to us. It's the same thing when you start talking about moving from platform to platform or from home to portable. If, if that's what consumers are going to want, if, if HBO was not on all of these platforms or on all these devices, then the consumer is not going to want to continue to subscribe. Okay, I'll give the audience one more chance. Virgil, you have a question for us? Wait for the microphone, please. Virgil Labrador, Satellite Markets. Uh, my question is for Javier. Uh, Javier, uh, what's your subscriber uh, number right at, at this moment, and uh, what percentage of the continental United States do you cover in terms of area and population? Well, what we well, we publicly announced we have about 2 million subscribers in the Fios. Uh, I'm talking about Fios TV, right? That's your question? Yes. Okay, we have we deployed the service in 13 states. I don't remember all of them, but include, uh, of course, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Virginia, um, California, Texas. And we have about 2 million subs announced by the end of last year in Fios TV. And uh, can you project how many subs will you get by the end of the year or in the next two years? Uh, yes, we can, but we can disclose that. Uh, okay. yeah. He would have to kill you. Um, <laughs> by the way, I so, so before we kill each other, we have run out of time. I'm going to leave it to just one final response from the panelists. And, it, and the, the, the essence of it, what's next? Given the changes in the technologies in the marketplace, what's next? I, uh, because... As I read the trend line in the industry, we're ready for another infrastructure play. The last time we had one was 93, 96, when MPEG-2 burst upon the, the scene and we're able to get multiple programs on the transponders. You get a ubiquitous kind of um, infrastructure out there and a lot of people have to play in that. I think what's coming is another infrastructure play uh, Internet protocol or Ethernet being the ubiquitous transport pro protocol and then you can format for whatever kind of device and programming you want to do. But right now it's, it's very um, unstructured and everybody's rolling their own and we're going to come back and I think there will be a new, a new version of an infrastructure play. Portability of video entertainment uh, and the Internet uh, is an enabler of that. I think the next step is, is, is definitely a different way to watch TV, any content, anytime, anywhere, from any device. Ron? Yeah, I, I think there'll be um, a complementary development with uh, uh, HD linear channels continuing to be in high demand and in parallel uh, a whole new um, mass of new types of content, um, specialized th thematic, uh, which are complementary to the mainstream linear channel so there'll be a huge growth in uh, video demand coming over broadband and other specialized uh, uh, con content services uh, but complementary thank you all right and because i get to ask questions i'll even answer this one myself uh, i've got two words for you benjamin it's not plastics but it's certainly um ubiquity and customer control it's all about the end user being able to make these decisions on all these platforms. It isn't race home to watch what I want to watch. If I'm, wherever I am is where it'll be. And I, I think that's where we'll leave it. I think the panelists have done a great job. Would you give them a hand?
Again, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this session, which is again Umbrado, Cisco Systems, Inmarsat, Intelsat, and World Teleport Association for putting this on, and the NAB as a, as a co-sponsor. Thank you very much.